Hello everyone. The purpose of this example is to demonstrate key concepts associated with modeling of a corn wet milling process integrated with production of glucose and fructose syrups. This video describes the process at a high level and presents the results of cost analysis. It also addresses modeling of batch steps in continuous flow sheets, recycling of materials in pull mode, and energy recovery approaches. Please note that the model that will be discussed during this video is part of the corn refinery example that is shipped with SuperPro. This model may be opened and viewed using the evaluation version of SuperPro Designer available here. There is also a thorough README file which comes with this model, which explains the process and the specifications associated with it in much greater detail. This video is only designed to provide a high-level overview of the process and its key results. Let's take a look at the corn refinery example now. Corn grains consist of three main components, the endosperm, the pericarp, and the germ. The pericarp consists mainly of fiber, the germ contains corn oil and other materials, and the endosperm consists mainly of starch granules and proteins called gluten. This corn refinery process initially fractionates corn with a wet milling process and then processes the generated starch to produce glucose and fructose syrups. The first section of this process performs corn steeping. Here, corn grains are transferred out of storage silos and mixed with an aqueous acid solution. The slurry is heated and transferred into steeping tanks. The grains are then separated from the steep liquor with a screen. The liquor is concentrated in an evaporator while the steeped grains enter the germ separation section. Note that although this flow sheet is in continuous mode, the steeping tanks operate in batch mode. Furthermore, there are seven tanks staggered with the original V101 vessel, meaning there are a total of eight steeping tanks. The operations within this procedure last for a total of 40 hours. Therefore, a new batch of material is sent to one of the eight steeping tanks every five hours. This can be understood more clearly by viewing the equipment occupancy chart. Here you can see vessel V101 and its seven staggered companions. You can also see that a new batch begins every five hours. As soon as a vessel transfers its material out at the end of a batch, new material is transferred into the vessel and the next batch is run. Also notice that there are several other procedures in this flow sheet which operate in batch mode with staggered start times. Furthermore, these other procedures have different batch-to-batch -batch cycle times. The saccharification in R103 takes longer than 40 hours, while the procedures in several other equipment units take much less than 40 hours. In addition, these quickly cycling procedures have fewer staggered units. Returning to the flow sheet, the screened corn from the corn steeping section is transferred to the germ separation section. Here it is ground and mixed with several streams that are recycled from downstream procedures. Note that within this flow sheet there are many examples of recycle loops. For instance, in this section the mixture passes through several hydrocyclones in order to separate the light germ from the heavier grains. Then, the recycle stream exiting hydrocyclone BC-102 sends the underflow back to the mixing unit to reprocess the remaining corn grains and recover additional germ. This process also includes extensive recycling of water in pull mode. The concept of recycling in pull mode is explained in detail in the miscellaneous modeling tips section of this example's README file. 
Recycling in pull mode greatly improves convergence of recycle loops and the stability of the overall model. Moving on, the light germ in this section is dewatered, while the grains are sent to the fiber separation section. In this section, the grains are ground again and then screened. The larger fiber and bran particles are retained on the screens, while the smaller starch and gluten particles tend to pass through. Multiple countercurrent recycle loops improve the overall separation of these components. The bran from the last screen is sent to a screw press to be dewatered. Then it is mixed with the concentrated steep liquor and dried in order to produce an animal feed co-product called corn gluten feed. Meanwhile, the filtrate from the first fiber screen is sent to the gluten separation section, where it is mixed with various recycled streams. A series of centrifuges then separates the denser starch from the lighter gluten. The gluten is dewatered and dried to produce corn gluten meal. The starch is washed in a series of hydrocyclones, and a portion of it is dried and sold as a co-product. The remaining starch is used for the production of glucose. In this section, the starch slurry is mixed with several additional materials and heated. The starch is then hydrolyzed and eventually converted to glucose in a saccharification tank. The syrup then enters the glucose 95% downstream section. Here, the syrup is purified in a filter which retains most of the proteins. The second purification step takes place within ion exchangers, which retain the syrup's ionic components. The outlet from the ion exchangers is heated and sent into an activated carbon column where traces of proteins, colors, and odors are removed. The glucose 95% syrup that is produced may be used as a sweetener. However, it may also be used as an intermediate for the production of high fructose corn syrup. In the HFCS section, the syrup is cooled, mixed with several other materials, and sent to the isomerization column, where some of the glucose is converted to fructose. The 42% fructose mixture is then purified using ion exchangers and activated carbon columns. The syrup is then concentrated in an evaporator. For much more detailed information on each of the sections in this model and their associated procedure and operation specifications, please refer to the detailed readme file of this example. In corn refinery processes, there are numerous opportunities for energy recovery that can reduce the cost of utilities. In SuperPro, heat recovery can be modeled either by adding heat exchangers to the flow sheet and connecting the streams which can exchange heat, or by using the virtual energy recovery feature of the tool. The latter is particularly useful during preliminary process design studies and when the required network of heat exchangers is very complicated. One example of explicit energy recovery with a heat exchanger is shown here. In this heat exchanger, a portion of the syrup is preheated by the vapors coming from an upstream flash tank. Simultaneously, the vapors from the flash tank are condensed and cooled. If the network of heat exchangers in a flow sheet is very complicated, SuperPro's virtual energy recovery feature may provide a better approach than explicitly defining each heat exchanger within the flow sheet. The upper table of this dialog provides information about each of the operations in the flow sheet which require cooling, while the lower table provides information about operations which require heating. This dialog also allows you to match specific heat sources with specific heat recipients in order to exchange energy between them, 
by clicking on the Recovered box and clicking the View Edit button. For instance, here you can see that the heat operations in P59 and P80 have been matched to the cool operation in P66. In this case, the streams associated with the P59 and P80 heat operations must be heated to 55 degrees Celsius and 70 degrees Celsius, respectively. The hot stream from the P66 operation can provide 100% of the heating requirement for these two streams. Simultaneously, roughly 59% of the cooling requirement for the P66 cool operation is met by exchanging heat with P59 and P80. The savings from the virtual heat recovery are reported in relevant SuperPro reports. More detailed information about virtual heat recovery can be found in the README file of this example. Next, I will show you some of the key results from this model. This model represents a facility capable of processing 50 metric tons per hour, or approximately 410,000 metric tons of corn per year. Although the key output in terms of revenues for this particular model is 42% high fructose corn syrup, abbreviated here as HFCS 42%, various other co-products are also produced. These include germ meal, corn gluten feed, corn gluten meal, natural starch, and 95% glucose syrup. Here, you can see that although HFCS 42% is the main contributor to the plant revenues, the sum of the revenues from the co-products is nearly as much as the revenue from the main HFCS 42% product. Based on the assumptions in this model, the total capital investment for this facility is roughly $200 million. Furthermore, the estimated annual operating cost is $127 million. The unit production cost was estimated to be 78 cents per kilogram of HFCS 42% syrup. The net unit production cost, which takes into account the savings associated with energy integration, is 77 cents per kilogram of HFCS 42% syrup. The costs and revenues associated with this model indicate this may be a promising project with a return on investment and a payback time of approximately 11.8% and 8.5 years, respectively. The rest of this report provides more detailed information about each of the cost and revenue components of the model. For instance, Table 2 provides information on the purchased cost of each equipment item in the flow sheet. SuperPro is equipped with correlations for estimating the purchase cost of equipment based on its type and size. If the default cost correlation for a given equipment unit is not suitable for a certain type of process, you may either enter an exact purchase cost for that equipment unit or define your own power law equations to estimate its cost. Detailed information on user-defined cost models can be found in the README file of this example. Once the equipment costs are determined, SuperPro Designer can estimate the total direct fixed capital, or DFC. The DFC includes direct plant costs, such as equipment costs, installation, process piping, buildings, etc. It also includes indirect costs such as engineering and construction, as well as other fees and contingency. Additional tables within the Economic Evaluation Report break out the resource requirements associated with the process, including labor, materials, consumables, and utilities. The rates of such resources are calculated by operations. 
the total requirement for each resource in each operation in the flow sheet is then multiplied by its respective unit cost to compute its associated annual operating cost. Similarly, waste treatment costs are based upon the calculated annual amounts of each waste stream and the user-specified unit costs for disposal of those wastes. The Economic Evaluation Report also provides a summary of the magnitude of each component of the annual operating cost as shown here. In this process, raw materials are the main contributor to the annual operating cost, followed by facility-dependent costs, utility costs, and labor costs. The facility-dependent cost is calculated based on estimates of annual maintenance, depreciation, and miscellaneous costs. A great deal of additional information about this process may be found in SuperPro's other reports and charts. This concludes the Corn Refinery Overview video. For additional details on how to create and analyze models in SuperPro, and for information on additional capabilities of SuperPro, please refer to the SuperPro manual and the other SuperPro example files, all of which are included with both the free SuperPro evaluation version and the full SuperPro application. Please also refer to the other online training videos located here. Thank you.